Hello and welcome to lab. Today we'll be doing experiment 13, quantitative analysis of an alloy. I'd like you to be my lab partner and I'd like you to follow along in your lab manual. Today we're going to determine the percent copper and the percent silver in a metal alloy. These percents may or may not add up to 100. There may be some other constituents in the alloy sample. This experiment has a lot of semester one techniques in it, and we'll just be reviewing those. And we'll also be introducing a new piece of equipment, the spectrometer. And this will be to determine our percent copper in solution. We'll measure the absorbance. It's a highly colored solution. And we'll be using titration to determine the percent silver. In step one, we'll need to add two boiling chips to our test tube. And these will ensure smooth boiling. And we'll also add 50 milliliters of water to a graduated cylinder. And this needs to be carefully measured, so be sure you get it eye level and measure at the 50.0, and that's three significant figures for this piece of equipment. Uh, three significant figures. All right. So I'm a little bit over. And I'm a little bit under, and I'll just add dropwise until the bottom of the meniscus is on the 50 milliliter mark. Now I'm going to add this 50 milliliters to the test tube. And then I'm going to mark it that level with a wax pencil. Okay, and sometimes you can also ma mark it with a tape, but this works fine. And then we will pour out the water, and this is step two now, um, and leave the boiling chips in the test tube. You don't have to get all of the water out, but get most of it out. Hold the test tube, the uh, boiling chips back in the test tube with a stirring rod. We lost one and we can put it right back in. All right, and we'll reassemble our apparatus. Okay, uh, in step three, we need to weigh approximately 0 0.5 grams of the alloy sample. I'd like you to do that and record the mass and the unknown number. Include both the alphanumeric and the numeric parts of the unknown number in your data sheet. Now we need to add that sample to our test tube. And I see that there's a little bit of the sample still on the 
uh, weighing paper. Just, I mean, it, it's grains, but just in case, I am going to. I'm going to put this back in. I'm just going to rinse that weigh paper, just a little bit. Okay, just down into the test tube. And I'm going to check to see if there's any sample on the sides, and there is. Uh, we are going to target that when we add the nitric acid in a later step. Now I need to assemble my gas trap. So I'm going to take off my hood apparatus, and I'm going to add about 150, the amount is not terribly important, 150 milliliters of DI water sorry, tap water, to our Erlenmeyer flask. And I'll add about 10 milliliters of sodium hydroxide to this uh, Erlenmeyer flask also. The sodium hydroxide will neutralize any toxic gases that are formed. And we'll put this Erlenmeyer flask back. We'll put the glass hood apparatus. Make sure that the hood, um, it will be over the test tube. It doesn't need to be a super tight fit, but it just needs to be over the test tube. And that the glass tubing here needs to be subsurface in your gas trap. We're going to bubble any gases through that are formed through the solution and they'll be neutralized. But we do need to use our aspirator here. And our aspirator, remember from semester one, is just a fancy name for the vacuum. And how we're going to do this, this is based on Bernoulli's principle. There's a small side arm on the water delivery here. And when water flows over uh, the arm, it's kind of on the back. I'm sorry, you cannot see it very well. Um, it will create a vacuum. And we're just going to turn that on. And if you see bubbling, you know there's a vacuum created and it's pulling any toxic uh, gas through into the solution to get neutralized. In step six, we're going to add two pipettfuls of nitric acid. There is a small bit of the alloy sample. We can kind of target that when we uh, kind of wash it down into the solution. So going to kind of get all the sides here and then quickly put the hood back over the test tube. All right, already you can see that some of the toxic gases are being generated. Those are the brown NO, NO2s. And right now I'm not going to even add any heat because it seems to be uh, dissolving well. While that's reacting, I will turn on my Bunsen burner. Remember we shut everything off first, both the gas and the air. Then I'm going to open up both of them one full turn. and then turn on my gas at the supply. With all this noise, I cannot hear it. Oftentimes you can give your striker a 
try first. And I can adjust this. This flame is too high, so you'll want to adjust the height of the flame by adjusting the gas flow with the bottom knob. And then we know we don't want a yellow flame. We're going to adjust the color by adding more oxygen. And we do this by turning the barrel. Uh, once you see a blue cone inside a blue flame, uh, you know it's good. It's virtually, uh, almost virtually colorless uh, to the camera. All right, we see that our sample is dissolved. That's good news, but we need to get rid of the oxides of nitrogen. And we're just going to apply heat very gently, not too much, a little bit, and then take it off. You don't want to bump any of this solution into your gas trap. If you do, you need to start over because you've lost some of your uh, copper and silver. And we're going to be heating this gently until we don't see any of the brown gas on the sides of the test tube. I'm seeing a little bit less brown gas, but I still see it there. We're not done yet. I can see my solution is a beautiful blue. Definitely the color I'm expecting. And I don't see any of the brown oxides of nitrogen on the side of the test tube, so I think we are done. We'll shut off the Bunsen burner at the source, and we can also shut off our aspirator. And now that we've done that, we can dilute this sample to the mark that we made earlier, our 50.0 milliliter mark with DI water. Now, be careful not to overfill it because you can't take anything out. So get it eye level. Maybe put a piece of white paper behind it 
to make sure you're right at the level. And there we go. There's our solution. We can now use our stopper. We'll remove the test tube from the clamp. and just mix it. Now the solution will be colored and it should be clear. If it is at all cloudy, let your instructor know. And now we can continue on with the rest of the experiment. The first thing we're going to do is calibrate our spectrometer. And there are instructions for this. There's a long set of instructions and an abbreviated one. And I've already turned the spectrometer on and I've let the light warm up for about a half an hour. We're going to be using a cuvette in our sample. Uh, there's a sample holder here. And uh, this holds our sample and we are going to be putting in our sample and then inserting it into the spectrometer. So let's talk about uh, a little bit of cuvette maintenance and how to uh, treat this properly to get good results. So the first thing is you need to use the cuvette for every single absorbance determination in your experiment. Uh, it could have a small scratch or um, something on it that uh, may differ from one cuvette to the other in light transmitting properties. So always use the same cuvette. You'll also have to normalize your cuvette before every time that you put a new sample in. And normalizing, you just fill it up, put it to waste, uh, and then fill it up again before you insert it in your spectrometer. All right, uh, you'll also have to be sure that you wipe the cuvette with a Kim wipe, uh, lint-free pieces of paper, uh, and be sure you wipe it off before you put it in the cuvette. You're wiping off any fingerprints, um, uh, any liquid that might have gotten on the outside of the cuvette. And then you'll also want to only uh, hold this by the very top of the cuvette, like this. All right. Be sure that you don't wipe it off and then handle it and put it in there. Only wipe it off, holding at the top, and then you can put it in and be sure you firmly press down. Now that I've normalized the spectrometer, we can establish a calibration curve with our three known solutions and our DI water that we calibrated our spectrometer with. These solutions will all be uh, measured, the absorbance will be measured at 800 nanometers. So I'm going to set that right now on my uh, computer. and we're reading at 800 nanometers and we'll be able to take screenshots of each one of these so you will have them. We'll be reading our absorbance at the bottom and it should be in red. Uh, it might be in green on this one, I don't know, but it will say absorbance and it will tell you the value. So we'll first put in our DI water sample and we know that contains zero grams of copper. So now we'll read the absorbance of this sample. Now to determine the calibration curve, we will measure the absorbance of known solutions of copper. 
and these are all uh, grams of copper per 50 milliliters of solution, very similar to what we have. I'll get rid of my water. And then with my first solution, this is 0 0.10 grams of copper per 50 milliliters of solution. We first have to normalize our cuvette. Just fill it up and send that to waste. Then fill it up again. And hold it by the top, wipe off the sides of the cuvette with a Kim wipe, and there's a small diamond or carrot, and that needs to be in the front, facing the light source, facing us, and now we can read this uh, absorbance value on our computer. Now we'll repeat this for the remaining two solutions, 0 0.15 grams of copper per 50 mils of solution and 0 0.20 grams of copper per 50 milliliters of solution. We'll get rid of what was in there previously, get a new pipette, because you don't want to use the one that was used for the last solution. Fill it up to normalize it, and fill it up again. Again, take the Kim wipe, wipe everything off, hold by the top. The little diamond in the front goes toward the light source, and let's read this reading, and we'll also do the next one. Now that you have your four data points for your known solutions, you need to construct a graph in Excel. There are detailed instructions for this in step five of your lab manual. Now that you've constructed the graph, we can determine the mass of copper in our sample. And so we'll get rid of what was last in there, and our cuvette to waste. And then we'll normalize our cuvette with a clean, disposable pipette. Get rid of that to waste. And fill this up again. Again, take a Kim wipe. Wipe the sides of the cuvette, again, only holding by the top and put it in the spectrometer with the uh, diamond facing us. And we can now read our absorbance. And then from the graph, you can determine the grams of copper per 50 mils of solution in your sample. Now that we've determined the absorbance of our unknown sample, we can get rid of that to waste and give the cuvette a little rinse for the next people. And then shut the strobe or the light off to the spectrometer and shut down the computer. Now that we've finished our copper determination, let's move on to our silver determination. I'm going to disassemble the gas trap so I have a little bit more room here. And then I'm going to obtain some potassium thiocyanate. Be sure to note the molarity that's on the carboy. And I'm going to normalize 
and then fill my burette with that solution. I'd like you to read and record the initial potassium thiocyanate burette reading. In step one, I'm going to normalize a 10.00 milliliter pipette with our solution, and then I'll draw up exactly 10.00 milliliters of our solution and transfer it to our Erlenmeyer flask. Now that I've added my sample to the Erlenmeyer flask, I'm going to bring up my volume using DI water in the Erlenmeyer flask to, oh, between about 25 milliliters. It's not terribly important. We just need to have enough volume so that we can see a color change. I'm also going to add 15 drops of the ferric alum indicator. And I'll give it a swirl and now I'm ready to titrate. Now we're ready to titrate. We're going to go to a very pale peach color. You will see some white precipitate in there um, and that is not of a big concern to us. We're going to a color change. All right, now I'm right-handed so I usually swirl with my right and I'll adjust the stopcock with my left. I'm going to move the stopcock. Be sure you don't pull it down but you can rotate it so that it's more comfortable for you. I don't really like to see a lot of that uh, in titrating. Do it so it's comfortable. And I'm going to go drop wise at first to get this going. And you'll see maybe a little bit of localized, I won't swirl for a minute, of that dark iron thiocyanate complex. But that will go away. And so I've got my left hand on the stopcock ready to shut off at any moment. I'm just going dropwise right now. And you can see that white precipitate. That silver thiocyanate. And I'm going to slow the, even though this is going drop wise, I'm going to slow the titration down a little bit when it appears that the brown color takes a little bit longer to go away. Just resume at a slower rate. Still white. And it is taking longer to go away the between drops, that brown color. So I know I'm getting closer to my end point here. Dropped it for a minute. I'm going to go drop wise. I'm 
going to just add maybe one drop at a time and keep on swirling. You just do not want to overshoot this end point here. Always touch the inside of the, the burette tip to the inside of the flask at some point in time. And even rinse off the sides just to be sure if there's any KSCN that was on the sides of the uh, Erlenmeyer flask with DI water. We are very close. And I would say that that is starting to be a very, very pale color. I'm going to find a piece of white paper and put that underneath. And we have just reached our final point of the titration. That's a very, very pale orange color. And we'll be sure to rinse the sides of the Erlenmeyer flask, just in case there was anything, any KSCN. And we are done. I'd like you to read the final burette reading of the KSCN. Now that we're done with the experiment, we can clean up. The remaining potassium thiocyanate in your burette can be put down the drain, but anything that has contained the copper or silver, uh, anything that the, has been in the alloy um, needs to go to hazardous waste. So we'll put it on our collection beaker, including your sample and any of the uh, known copper solutions. That all goes to hazardous waste, and then that gets transferred to the large hazardous waste carboy in the back hood. You can now complete your calculations. Thank you for being my lab partner today. For the first three questions of the error analysis, an error is given. In sentence form, state what species this would impact, what would be the effect on the quantity of the parameter measured, and how would the final results appear to be affected. An example is given. Since the first question is such an important error, let's go through the thought process in answering that question. Question one, if there were scratches or fingerprints on the cuvette, what species would this impact? What would be the effect on the quantity of the parameter measured? And exactly how would the final results appear to be affected? Since the cuvette is used in the spectrometer, let's look at the schematic of the spectrometer. Light reaches the spectrometer, and the sample in the spectrometer absorbs various wavelengths of light depending on the species and concentration. The light that is not absorbed is sent to a detector. The detector calculates the amount of light incident to the sample and the amount of light passed through the sample and converts this to an absorbance. The more light a sample absorbs, the higher the absorbance. So what species would this error impact? The only species, and we have silver and copper to choose from here, measured in the spectrometer, is copper. 
Silver is not measured with a spectrometer. Now, if there was a fingerprint, scratch, dirt, or liquid on the outside of the cuvette, some of the light that is incident on the sample would be refracted. The detector sees a diminished amount of light passing through the sample. The detector cannot differentiate between absorbed and refracted light and therefore assumes the refracted light has been absorbed by the sample and the absorbance increases. Using the graph that you have constructed, a higher absorbance reading correlates with a higher mass of copper. This, in turn, would make the percent copper in the sample appear greater. Take this data and put it in complete sentences to answer question one. Complete the next two questions using similar reasoning.